So when Jeff graduates from college in 1986, he does not go into finance right away. He goes and works for a startup. He works for this company called Fitel, which had been founded by a couple Columbia computer science professors and was developing like a very, very early network technology for high-speed trading applications. Huh. They were like tech for, I don't know if it was exactly like today, all this stuff is co-located in data centers with the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, but right. like kind of a precursor to that. So he does that for two years. And then in 1988, he's like, all right, like I'm, you know, working for this startup, building infrastructure for this then completely new discipline of finance of like quantitative trading and finance. Those guys, our customers are actually making a lot more money. <laughs> Maybe I should go work for them. But it is pretty good. I mean, great experience at that point in time. Being around early networked computing was pretty beneficial to give him not just the sort of like basic understanding of how it works, but also like what all the numbers mean. Like when I'm watching bits and bytes fly back and forth, or I'm looking at packet counts, or I'm looking at what hardware can support what bandwidth, what are the practical implications so that you can sort of feel the types of applications you could build using infrastructure of the day? The reason we're spending so much time on Jeff's early years, and now we're going to spend a lot of time on this chapter, it's totally like one of those Steve Jobs things. Like you can't connect the dots yes. looking forward. But when you look back through Jeff's past, Joy Cuffey, who we'll talk about, actually has like this quote that she gives to Brad Stone. Like it's like a straight line, you know, yeah. from birth to Jeff Bezos today. Like it makes total sense. Well, it's really hard to cover Amazon as a business without it being a Jeff Bezos biography, because in so many ways, Amazon is an, an extension of Jeff Bezos's brain. Like it really is a company made in his image. And that's kind of the case for a lot of these types of people. Like you look at Apple, that was very much the case for Steve Jobs. Also, by the way, an adopted son of immigrants. Yep. I've always just found that interesting. But in some ways, I'm thinking, okay, cool, let's get to the Amazon story. But even though it's called Amazon, at least for a very long time, call it its first decade, it really is just Jeff Bezos at scale. Probably arguably for longer than that. I mean, until recent times. Yep. So in 1988, he leaves Fitel, the startup, and he goes to work actually in banking, I believe almost surely, I don't know for sure, but I can't imagine he's not doing quantitative trading and finance. Like he's a technical guy, he's a computer science graduate. He had been working in this sort of network operations for early stage quant finance. That's probably what he's doing. So he goes to the investment bank, Bankers Trust, which then through a series of mergers, as always happens on Wall Street, becomes part of Deutsche Bank. <laughs> Deutsche Bank's going to oh, come back up later in the episode. That. Yep, yep. He's worked at startups, you know, computer science. Like he's got this entrepreneurial kind of bug. So on the side... He becomes friends with a guy named Halsey Miner, which uh, listeners are probably a bunch of bells are going off. And they almost start a startup together at this point in time. The idea was it was going to be a financial newsletter idea, but they become buddies. That doesn't work out. But Halsey, like right around this time, right after that, goes on to start CNET. It's crazy. The internet was so freaking small then. And also, like if you were to squint and describe CNET at a really high level, it's like distributing the written word over this budding World Wide Web, which is sort of what Amazon did. Yeah. Ultimately, it distributed them through an abstraction layer where you print the words on paper first and then you ship the paper. But they would go on to start businesses riding the same wave. Yep. And I think they remain friends for, well, certainly for a while, if not still to this day. And Bezos does always sort of chuckle at that, where people would say, wait, you're starting this business that's meant to take advantage of this new piece of technology. And the new piece of technology is particularly good at distributing hypertext over a globally available network. And the way that you're doing that is specifically not by putting the text in the browser, which can read the hypertext directly onto a screen. Right. And he does always chuckle about that. But it is funny to this day, you still can't really search books. You Google search right. something, you're going to get websites. You're not going to get books. And despite Amazon and Google and everyone trying, the book publishers have sort of very physically DRM'd these books such that you cannot search them in a very digitally native internet way. Yeah, it's funny. Even today. 
So in 1990, Jeff gets a fateful call from a headhunter. Jeff's happy where he is. He was thinking about starting this startup and uh, convinces Jeff to go interview at a new firm, financial firm, that has been started just a couple of years earlier called D.E. Shaw. And Jeff, I think unexpectedly, completely falls in love. <laughs> falls in love in uh, many ways at yeah. D.E. Shaw. So some history on D.E. Shaw for folks who don't know. I didn't know a lot of this. So the founder, David E. Shaw, was a Stanford computer science PhD from the 80s who then went on to become a computer science professor at Columbia University, I assume with some of the professors who went on to go found Fitel that Jeff originally worked Probably. for. Yeah. He was like a serious, is a serious academic. He's actually back in academia now. He won the Gordon Bell Prize David twice. Shaw is back in academia? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Not at an institution, but he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences. Like he's the real deal. His stepfather, when he was growing up, was a finance professor at UCLA. And so he'd always kind of been interested in finance, mm. but had studied computer science and was an academic. In 1986, he left Columbia to join Morgan Stanley and then started D.E. Shaw in 1988. And I think his model for this was Jim Simons, who in 1982 started Renaissance Technologies and Rentec. I bet actually a lot of people listening don't know. Like I just said that name and a lot of people are like, oh, what's You're like, that? Okay, great. What are these guys talking about? It won't hit you as like, oh, right. The firm that consistently produces the greatest returns of all time, but they're not taking any more capital. And so you can't get your capital in. Dude, Rentec and Simons is unreal. I'm pretty sure they are the best performing investors of all time. Full stop, period. <laughs> We should do an episode on Rentech. If we can get any information. I mean, that's the interesting thing about Rentech is like, it's a fortress. So supposedly, the core medallion fund, which is now all private capital of Rentech employees and Simons himself, like there's no outside investors, mm -hmm. averaged a 66.1% <laughs> annual return from 1988 to 2018. 30 years. What? At 66% compounding. Nobody's ever beaten that. We may need to go regrade our uh, Berkshire Hathaway episodes. Yes, yeah, seriously, seriously. But that was the inspiration for D.E. Shaw. And D.E. Shaw has not performed that well. But of hedge funds today that people can actually invest in, like D.E. Shaw and a couple others are the legacy of that. Right. And while this was the business model of D.E. Shaw being a quant hedge fund, they always resisted the idea that that's what defined them. They very much thought of themselves as the sort of group of creative artisans who, you know, invested in businesses and started businesses and came up with new ideas and viewed the world through different lenses. And sure, this is how they make money, but Desco or DES Co was so much more than that. Totally. Well, and I think this is what Jeff falls in love with about the firm and about David. So Jeff joins... He rises through the ranks super quickly. He becomes the fourth senior vice president at the firm. So like highest level below David. And I assume by far the youngest. He's like in his mid to late 20s at this point. He is like the future, like the rising star at D.E. Shaw. And he and David become super close. Now, there's not a lot written about this, which you'll maybe see why in a second. But like they were very close. And, and I got to imagine that David kind of saw himself as a, you know, a mentor to yeah. Jeff. Oh, for sure. So Jeff loves it there. He's involved in recruiting, bringing in all these super smart people of all disciplines into DE Shaw. And the MO was kind of like, we just want to find the smartest people in the world. Doesn't matter if they know nothing about business and finance. You know, it's kind of like Bridgewater today is kind of the inheritor of this. Like, just bring them in here and we'll <laughs> figure out stuff for them to do. So a bunch of people who become really key early Amazon employees. Jeff Holden, I believe Bezos, is involved in recruiting. Who would later, of course, join Amazon right around two years after its founding. Amazing how that happened. It's conspicuously close to two years exactly after Jeff left E. Shaw. Yeah, but maybe like there's a non-compete or something. Non-solicit. Nicholas Lovejoy and another Princeton grad 
who joined the firm, Mackenzie Scott Tuttle. <laughs> and uh, that's what we were referring to of Jeff falling in, in love at D.E. Shaw in more ways than one. Yep. Jeff and Mackenzie would get married. And I think technically Mackenzie was the first Amazon employee. Yes, it's interesting. I don't know technically in terms of like literally was she the first person to become a W-2 employee, but certainly she was already doing work, I think particularly on accounting, working with legal, kind of setting up the operations of the business before Jeff hired Shell Kappen, who was the first yep. engineer, the first sort of full-time hire other than he and McKenzie. Yeah, but McKenzie was like definitely like an employee yes. of the business, doing work on the business. So within D.E. Shaw, kind of like you said, they're this quant trading firm and like, yeah, that's how they make their money. But they view themselves as being kind of entrepreneurial and starting these other businesses and doing stuff. And so David has Jeff working on a bunch of this stuff. The first project he leads is building out what they called the third market business. And it was an idea that to create a sort of separate market from the exchanges where retail investors could trade without paying. At that time, you're paying a lot in commissions to your brokerage mm -hmm. house. So super cool. Which, by the way, this feels like it's probably the predecessor to dark pools. Oh. I mean, if they're making transactions off exchange and then batch shipping them to exchanges to get lower fees, that is sort of the financial world that we live in today, where lots of transactions happen off the exchange. And that's sort of the predecessor to payment for order flow. I mean, they, they were at the early days of all this stuff. Robin Hood and Citadel and all that. Well, they definitely were because at the same time, the internet is, it's so early, you know, we're in like early, you know, mosaic Netscape days, like 92, 93. But David and Jeff, you know, given their backgrounds and like David having done his PhD at Stanford, they know all these people that are <laughs> starting the internet. And even Bezos himself, I mean, when he was, I think in college, he had used the internet when it was fully just command prompt based and there was no GUI. It was just the very basic protocols and a Unix command terminal. And you can maybe Telnet was around yeah. at that point, but yeah, there was no World Wide web. Yes. So David and Jeff get really excited about this and David kind of reassigns Jeff as one of the most senior people in the firm that the two of them are going to work together to come up with business plans that they're going to start internet opportunities within DE Shaw. So I think the first one that they do is a online retail brokerage for financial trading, like E-Trade. It was a competitor yep. to E-Trade. And I don't know for sure, but I wonder if that maybe the third market business that Jeff was working on might, might have like transformed into this because it makes so much more sense over the internet. Who got the truth? Who? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Who got the truth now? Hmm. 